Hello, friends. It's time for the Gold and Steel podcast once again, where we cover all things Vegas Golden Knights. I'm JP here with my usual partner in crime, Ian. And very quickly, what we're going to cover today, we're going to cover Vegas's super hot start. We're going to talk about San Jose and their woes. Uh, we're going to talk about Patrick Kane. What's going on with that guy? Where is he headed? Could he wind up in Vegas? Uh, we're going to cover the Henderson Silver Knights and what's going on with them. We're going to cover the tragic death of Adam Johnson and the implications of that for neck safety in and around hockey leagues all over the world. And of course, also why the NHL needs to make it easier to follow teams abroad, which is something that's very significant for my co-host, Ian. Ian, buddy, it's good to see you. How you doing? And, and before I turn it over to you, man, I just realized something. We've been at this for two years. We uh, <laughs> like you didn't have that queued up. <laughs> yeah, exactly. exactly. It just happened to already be yeah, on the just soundboard. To already have ready, it. dude. <laughs> dude. I'm gonna pause it because this goes on for like two minutes. So we don't want two minutes of that. Dude, we'll can you sued, believe so. it, man? We've been we've been doing this for two years, and for for anybody who's well played, by the way, but um, for Sorry. anybody who's new to the show or who joined us sometime over the last year, year and a half, how this started is Ian reached out to me. Uh, I was active on Twitter following the Golden Knights. Ian already had a podcast, reached out to me, and had me on the show as a guest, right? And then right. it just kind of things right. kind of grew from there, and then we things turned into this, and it's it's been a great ride, man. But can you, two years, it goes by fast, huh? It's flown by. I didn't realize that until you mentioned it this morning. Oh, this morning for me, this evening for you. I didn't realize it had been that long. But yeah, 25th of August was the first yeah. time that our yeah. paths crossed. Uh, actually, uh, like you said, after you agreed to do the, do the podcast. And uh, yeah, yeah, man, it's been good. It's been a good two years. A lot's yeah. changed because back then it was Vegas were, you know, are they going to make the playoffs? And then there was the year that they didn't. Obviously, we know that well. And then there was last year, which was obviously insane. Um, yeah. So yeah, so yeah, well, it's been good. Here's yeah. for another. Here's for another two years. Then I have to use that uh, soundbite <laughs> again. <so. laughs> Absolutely, buddy. We'll uh, we'll use that every two years. But um, and that yeah, that leads me into talking about Vegas. I mean, geez, it's a great time for both of us, uh, not just for the show, but I mean, look, Henderson Silver Knights are off to an incredible start. They're second yeah. in the league right now, I think. We're going to cover that in a few minutes. But uh, And the Golden Knights, of course, are off to the, hardest, the hottest start in franchise history. And then the only point that Vegas missed, because they've earned 21 out of a possible 22, <laughs> the only point that Vegas missed was stolen from them by your very own Chicago Blackhawks, who was, we all yeah. know is, is your um, longtime favorite franchise. Uh, it's, uh, it's pretty incredible. And uh, let's just let's just look a little bit here at at Vegas's hot start. I mean, and they won again tonight. By the way, they beat Winnipeg. I think the final score was five to two. Uh, so yeah, absolutely trounced them as well. Like it wasn't, yeah. oh, wasn't yeah. close. It wasn't even close. Hat trick by Jonathan no. Marsha. So I mean, honestly, it's a little bit freaky. And they're not even playing their best hockey yet. But let me look at some of the some of the info here. Twenty one out of twenty two points, and and obviously that one point was the overtime loss to Chicago. <laughs> Um, in my opinion, they're not even playing their best hockey yet. And, and they'll even say that in interviews, Cassidy's interviews, the players' interviews. They're not happy with how they're playing. That's what's crazy. They're winning. Yeah. Massive record. They're, 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 I mean, they've lost one once in overtime. They haven't even lost in regulation. And they're nope. not entirely happy with how they're playing. Um, they have not played a complete game yet, in my opinion, including tonight against Winnipeg. Um a lot of things that they still have to tighten up. Uh, right now, as as we're recording this, they have a six point lead over the second place team in the division, Vancouver. And uh, a few days ago, I don't know if it still stands now, but I saw someone post one of the local Vegas Golden Knights uh, press that covers the team posted that they have more points than half of the Pacific Division put together. <laughs> I mean, there, <laughs> there's some teams in the Pacific Division that are tanking pretty hard, and we're going to get to that. Um, but uh, yep. I mean, Stanley Cup hangover? What? That there is no Stanley Cup hangover right now. I mean, this no. is a sign of a really good team. It, it's crazy, Ian. Right? This is nuts. Well, I, I mean, I, I did not expect to start this strong. 
No, I expected it to be a hangover. I, I think, and one of our listeners can, or, or viewers, if you're watching us on YouTube, and if you are, hello. Um, but I, I don't believe that there's ever been a Stanley Cup champion that has started the following season with this sort of record. Most have the hangover, the almost infamous Stanley Cup hangover, which hasn't happened this time. Um, and like you said, you're 10-0-1, uh, which is pretty much as good as it gets. Um, but and I, I, I see your point around they're not, it's not a complete game yet, but I do think there's some great things you can already see in the, in the team, uh, ignoring things like Marshall Sos hat trick tonight. Okay. And I think he's on for me personally for a real bumper year. It's a contract year, I believe. Um, I've got cap friendly open at the moment for something we'll talk about later. Uh, so I'm just going to very quickly double check now. Um, yes, as I thought it was. So he's last year of his deal. Tends to be the year that people play fantastic anyway. Mm. Every goal he scores, you can just hear like ka ching every time because it's yeah. another dollar that gets added to his, his contract. <laughs> yeah. But earning those bucks. He's, yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. He's been fantastic. But in terms of goals for and goals against, because uh, those of you that are long time listeners to the podcast, you know that when it comes to stats, that tends to be where I sit. Be a third at the moment in goals for and sixth in goals against. Obviously, first being the best, 32nd being the worst in both which means that you're obviously a pretty rounded game. Um, but what I like is the two big things for me. So one is the fact that you're, we're seeing points across the board, right? So you've got people like Carlson, Eichel, um, Stevenson. Uh, they're all all performing. Uh, you've got, and when I talk about performing, we're talking like a point per game performance. So this is, this is fantastic, you know. Um, and, and then you've got the goalies on top, which is the other point, right? So you, Currently, Thompson has a nine three one save percentage, and Hill has a nine two three save percentage. God. Well, I mean that is a goalie tandem that the team we're going to talk about in a minute could only dream of. And right. fact, most teams in the NHL oh. could only dream of two top uh, notch. I mean, a lot of teams both wish to have fantastic. one goalie doing that well. Yeah, it, it, exactly, exactly. Yeah. And then you've got you've got the defensive part as well. So you've got Shea Theodore, who's also performing fantastic. Um, he's in the top four point scorers and it's not just a case of it being assists as well these guys are all contributing with goals then you've got the rookies that come in so you've got I presume it's pronounced Korzak by the way which is the defenseman yep. mm-hmm. he's got four points Dorofayev has got two and is it Pachal or Pakal <laughs> uh, Pachal. Pa- I've heard it pronounced Pachal Braden uh, Pachal, Braden Pachal, okay, Pachal yeah you. so I'm going to throw his name to you every time because that's uh, <laughs> you've got that you've got that nailed but him and uh, let's, let's go with his first name going forward. Even he's got a point on the board. So yeah. your, your penalty kill is at 89.7%. Now, it's 11 games, so I can already hear the, the voice of my own head, as well as uh, you know lots of other fans of other teams saying, guys, chill out. It's 82 games. You've played 11. You could tank for the next 30 games, mm-hmm. and your first 11 games don't mean jack. Totally get that. But the numbers, and that's the, the analytics state that this team is an absolute juggernaut currently. Mm-hmm. Now, that could change. Of course, that could change. But they've had to deal with injuries. They've had to deal with setbacks. You've had people like Dora Fayev and you know, Pakal and all the rest come in and, and play play well. Um, they've got a power play is 23%. I don't remember a time when Vegas' power play was that high. I could be not, wrong again. Not, not in recent years. If I am. Not in recent but, years, yeah. Yeah, okay, maybe a game or two, but mm-hmm. consistently, I would have thought it was low, tw- really low 20s, very late teens is where I tended to remember them being. So kind of middle of the road when it comes to, to penalty kills. So I think it's a fantastic start. Uh, long may it continue. There will be bumps in the road. There will be losing streaks. I think that's guaranteed to happen in 82 games. Um, I don't expect that Thompson and Hill will finish with these safe percentages. <laughs> they may prove me wrong. If they do, great. Um, but what we said on the last episode, in terms of the preview episode, about why this team was set up for long-term success is these two things that we're seeing now. That is the elite players are playing at an elite level, whether that's Carlson, whether that's Eichel, whether that's Shea Theodore, doesn't matter. Um, and that goalie tandem is insane to be paying i think it's 4.7 million is what you're paying per Ugh, year for that right which is right. insane sorry oh, yeah. correction you're paying five points uh, the grand total of 5.6 million so 4.9 mm-hmm. million is what aiden hills on 
mm-hmm. and 767,000, if I round it up, um, not this much point, is what Logan Thompson's earning. And that is just crazy to have that level of goalie, you know, t- twice for that price. That is normally, I mean, 5.6 million. There's goalies in the NHL that are nowhere near as good as either of those two goalies that are being paid that. Mm-hmm. So that is Vegas' secret weapon. It's the fact that you could, Thompson could go down tomorrow, touch what he doesn't, by the way, but he could go down injured tomorrow and you've still got an elite level goalie one way or the other. And, and it allows you to share the load. It's just such a, such a benefit to have. Mm-hmm. It's an absolute bargain for the team. And then they can, they use that, they're able to use that money, that cap space, right? For other players, for forwards, for defensemen, for whatever. Um, and right now they're splitting the yeah. load too. I don't know that it'll be yeah, that yeah. way all season, but Cassidy's basically just alternating them. Thompson Hill, Thompson Hill, Thompson Hill. Um, it's crazy. And do you think, I'm curious about this. Uh, do you think that that's good? scouting good recruit i mean good development is it the goalie coach is it that the i think part of it is that the vegas defense is so incredible and you saw it tonight against winnipeg we started to see that stingy stingy vegas defense Mm -hmm. that there was a big part of what won them a championship last year so i think this is a very goalie friendly system right Mm -hmm. but Those guys still have to make the stops. And I've watched them both this year make some incredible stops already. You know, Mm -hmm. we're only 11 games in and I've watched both. So I I think too, there's a lot of credit due to Vegas's goalie coach. It's interesting. You hear the commentators talking about how quiet the goalies are in the crease, meaning like they're calm in the crease, right? They're not frantic. They're not chasing the puck. Like in the middle of all this chaos, there's something about his coaching style. So it, it's just, is it just a sweet combination of just all kind of the perfect mix of things? Like, what is mm-hmm. it? What, what, why are Vegas's goalies performing so well? Do you have any thoughts on that? So I think it's a mix. So you've got scouting for some. So Aiden Hill was definitely good scouting. Mm-hmm. You know, they they picked him up. He was obviously, I think, at Arizona at the time. Yeah. Um, had played some NHL games, but not many. Um, Aiden Hill was touted to be this kind of level of goalie. And then he kind of faded away. And it, it then looked like maybe he won't be the starter that everybody thought he was going to be. This was obviously in his Arizona years. And then Vegas picked him up. And obviously we saw what happened there. So I think it's good scouting. I think there's an element of luck because goalies, unlike some other positions, and if there's any goalies that listen to this podcast, they're probably going to take great offense to this comment. But I mean it in, in, in with, with, with positivity, right? Which is that for forwards and defensemen, when they're like 19, 20, you can already tell whether they're going to be elite, whether they're going to be kind of middle of the road, but NHL level, or whether they're just not going to make the cut. You can kind of tell. And there's not many defensemen that come into the NHL, completely kind of flop out and then come back in later when they're 25, 26 and make a, and become like an elite level defenseman. That doesn't really happen. But with goalies, that can happen because the goalie development arc to me seems like it's a longer kind of gestation period than it is mm-hmm. for forwards and defensemen, which yeah. means that there's always an element of luck when you're drafting because you don't really know like who's going to end up as elite level and who's not. I mean, there's been first round goalies drafted over the last couple of years, which is pretty rare anyway. Um, but they're not all going to be hits. Like some of them are going to be busts. It's just the way it is. Mm-hmm. What's good about someone like Logan Thompson is that he has had that kind of, like he's still young, obviously. I'm just double checking his age now. Um, but <laughs> he's 26, right? So he's not old. But at 26 to only really be breaking out in the last couple of years, that shows you that that trajectory. Now, he could well be um, Vegas Golden Knights starting goalie in a, in a year or so's time when Hill's contract ends, or he could go be a starting goalie somewhere else. But this kid has had to go through the ringer, including years in the AHL, years in the ECHL, WHL, et cetera, et cetera. So I think you're just kind of hoping some of these guys kind of flurry out. But the, the one thing I think you're right in what you said is the goalie coach is key. Because for goalies, it's not normally whether or not they have the ability. It's normally the headspace. Mm. So can they keep mm-hmm. it going? Because we've yeah. seen plenty of goalies that start fantastic. They hit a rut. 
they can't get out of that rut. And then you just see like a nosedive in terms of career. And, and I think that is a big factor in terms, obviously the person's own kind of mental strength, but the goalie coach, the coaching staff around them, it's a, a big factor. So I don't, I think it's a mix of those things, JP, as to why they are where they are, but you can't, there's got to be a little sprinkle of, of luck in there as well. Sure, sure. Yeah, there's there's always a degree, uh, an element of chance in all this, right? Even going on a deep playoff run or winning the cup, some things have to kind of fall in place just based on chance, right? But it's 100%. interesting, though, the, the goalie position, as you mentioned, is probably the most, I don't know the best way to describe it, the, the, the most psychological, right? It is the most dependent on headspace and goalies have to kind of they have to be sort of a special kind of personality. And it's interesting because the, the Vegas goalie coaches, it's like his style, the style that he coaches is almost reflective of like a calm kind of mm-hmm. mellow, don't panic. It, it, I hear the commentators say this all the time. They to talk about these goalies. It's like, look how calm he is in the crease. Look how still his legs are in the crease. And that's clearly the style that, and, and you hear about this guy, uh, tweaking goalies like not not necessarily completely reinventing them but looking at their style and their strengths and then tweaking it just ever so slightly right to yep. to uh, uh to maximize what they can do but the consistency that i seem to see the consistent thing i hear is is that calmness in the crease and i, I do see that and it wow it seems to be work i mean you know it's nuts too they, they did a tribute for loren brossois tonight who's now plays for the jets and he was half of Again. the tandem that got them to the Stanley Cup last year. So that's that's mm-hmm. what's crazy. Brossois, this other guy, we're not even talking about him anymore, plays for another team. And, no. and he got them halfway there. A guy who most of his career has been considered probably a second string guy, a backup guy, right? And yeah. and he got them halfway to the Cup. If he hadn't been injured, he probably would have took them all the way. So, uh, yeah. And there you go. Yeah, it's it's fascinating. And and go ahead. What were we gonna say? No, 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 that's that that's that luck element as well. I yeah. think like someone like Brossois, you about taking a chance when it's there. Mm-hmm. And I think both Thompson and Hill have done and Brossois, but Thompson and Hill now have done a great job of doing that. Yeah. Um yeah. and whatever happens, Vegas have got this tandem for this year and next year. Yeah. And next year, either they've got a fantastic piece to trade, by the way, mm-hmm. uh, in terms of Logan Thompson, if they were to decide to do that at the end of this year. Because that's a it's a hell of a talent on a very cheap contract, mm-hmm. but more than likely they'll run both contracts to the end, and then they'll have to make a choice. Yeah, they'll, yeah, they'll have to pick Just a starter the, the, and pay him. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and they'll right. have to pay him. Yeah, yeah and he, yeah. like as, you know the goalie that you guys were against tonight, Cole Ellerbuck. You see what happens when you have an elite level goalie. Yeah, he comes there, and there might be a one in the number he wants. Mm-hmm. But it's, it's not on its own, right? There's <laughs> some other digits as well, and that's it's going to be yeah. painful, I think, when that happens. Oh yeah, that's the that's the drawback, right, of having these two guys who are performing so well is that you're going to have to write them big fat checks when the time comes, and and more power <laughs> to them, right? They've earned it, but uh, yeah, in 100%. the me- you know, in the meantime, ho- hopefully Foley's plan of he wants a dynasty, he wants three cups in this window. Maybe the Knights will be fortunate enough to knock off one more. Uh, before one of these guys has to move on. But uh, anyway, it's been a fantastic start. And uh, I'll tell you somebody who has not had a fantastic start, and I'm talking possibly one of the worst performances, uh, the worst teams the NHL has seen in a very long time, possibly. In the, yes, very appropriate here. And, and honestly, <laughs> as a Golden Knights fan, we couldn't be happier about this. The San Jose Sharks are off to an absolutely abysmal start. And before I throw it to you, Ian, I'm just going to say tonight they played Vancouver. And I got to check the final score uh, here. But I know that Vancouver scored <laughs> scored yeah. 10. Yes, you heard me right. They they scored 10 goals. Okay, final score 10 to 1. So the Sharks did not get shut out. Uh, ten goals, by the way, is more goals. Every cloud. That that's exactly how how many goals the Sharks have for the entire season. I mean, <laughs> they are redefining rebuild in San Jose, and I think most Golden Knights fans couldn't be happier about that. If you're going to talk in terms of Schadenfreude, but what is happening in San Jose? I mean, this is uh, it's a rebuild, wow. but good lord, ten to one. This is they're off to a terrible start. So. 
so I'm obviously a Vegas sympathizer, so I don't quite have the same hatred for San Jose that most of our listeners and viewers probably have. Um, I do have a couple of things to say on this though. So one, I mean, look, it's a complete dumpster fire. There's no, there's no way to go around it. I mean, the, the start of the season they've had is absolutely diabolical. Um, I mean, even if you look at the cold stats, you could say, well, they've been unlucky in a few games, but if you read the stats, you would realize that they have not been unlucky in any games. They've they're deserved terrible. exactly what they've got. <laughs> yeah. um, their goalie safe percentages are, are actually reasonable, which is bizarre. So 907, which is, I mean, look, it's not great. You wouldn't want your goalies to be in that. It could be worse. I think the yeah. average in the in the NHL is nine oh eight, nine oh nine. So it's not massively. It's not like the goalies are, yeah. you know, are, are letting in everything that goes past them. It's middle of but the road. Yeah, it, it's middle of the road. Yeah, but the goals against average per game, and this is an average. Okay, is three point one six. Now, obviously, that would have been bumped up by tonight's, but still, that's horrendous. Mm-hmm. When your average goals per game is one. So on average, you're losing by two goals. Again. Yeah, yeah. The, these That's games aren't even work. close. Yeah, they're now, not even in these games. Yeah. The thing that annoys me about San Jose, and uh, and this is coming from a position, uh, my uh, argument uh, from a Blackhawks perspective was that Stan Bowman waited far too long to press the rebuild button. And it's like constant, oh, well, we'll just retool, we'll just retool, we'll just retool. Mm-hmm. I, I've never seen it work. I've never seen it work. I don't think it works. Um. Vegas don't count because the way they started. But for most teams, you, you go through a cycle. There's a window, the window's open, the window closes. You wish it would stay open longer. It doesn't. And when it closes, the clever teams work that out. And they work out that at that point in time when that window's just closing, that's when your players have the highest value so you can trade them for the most assets. And you tear if it you all miss down. That, if you miss that window and everything goes to pot or they get too old... Problem is, you've got no assets to trade. And when you've got no assets to trade, the rebuild takes that much longer. You know, it, Chicago were guilty of this with Jonathan Taves and Patrick Kane. They basically got nothing for them, which is disgraceful. Whereas they, they should they should have realized, and I can't blame Carl Davidson for this. He wasn't there. But the previous GM, so Stan Bowman, should have realized that window was closing. And it's, it's a hard thing to do. But San Jose are quoted as saying that they were never going to rebuild. It's one of their, I can't think of the GM's name. That was going to do my head in. Really? I feel like his name's Doug Wilson. But anyway. Did they uh, really was, say that? But the, <laughs> the, um, <laughs> Yeah, yeah. So wow. obviously, I know that's not. Again, I know there's a change. You know, there's been changes in in, mm. in in lots of things at San Jose, including the GM from memory. But the um, but the, the point still is that they they were adamant for years they were never going to rebuild. Um, now, obviously, that decision has been made for them now. Um, but it's it's going to be painful. I mean, mm. this year isn't a mm-hmm. Conor Bedard year. There are some very very elite level talents that you would be more than happy to have if you're the first overall pick. But for the San Jose supporters, this is going to be painful because they look they look like what Chicago wanted to be last year, uh-huh. but never quite was, yeah. which is literally a complete dumpster fire yeah. where you are. And the problem you have with taking that strategy is for the younger players. And there are some positives, by the way, in terms of San Jose. Um, Henry, I presume it's pronounced Thrun, by the way, it's T-H-R-U-N. He actually is playing quite well. Mm-hmm. He's on an absolutely crap team, obviously, but and he's in defense, which means that his statistics are being butchered. But actually, in terms of him being NHL quality, he looks quite good. Mm-hmm. Um, but what a demoralizing like, like kind of position to be in if you're uh, a young kind of... Yes, you're playing in the NHL and that'll be exciting, but having your ass kicked for 82 games isn't going to make you feel good at all. <laughs> yeah. right? And, and you know, I know some players he'll better learn off, but him and, and Hurtle are like literally the only two bright spots. And I don't, in my personal opinion, I could be wrong. Thomas Hurtle to me is the sort of player that I would be trading. Um, yeah. He's on a long contract, so that doesn't yeah. help uh, his, his trade value. But, there's absolutely no point in him being in San Jose because that team is is going nowhere and they they will be 30 second. Yeah. And again, I hope, you know, maybe I'll be proven wrong. I highly doubt it. They'll be 30 second. Yeah. But wow. I what mean, a way. They they're yeah, you know? they're off to an absolutely abysmal start. You know, I don't think it I don't think it helps that San Jose and I know this is a few years ago now, but the year that, in fact, it's probably four or five years ago now, but the year that they went really deep, right? They remember they made it all the way to the conference final, I think. And, 
you know, they were so banged up. The Blues knocked them out. So it was the year the Blues won the Cup. So yeah, this is four or five years ago now. But I don't think it helps that they yeah. had a really deep run because you know what they're thinking. You know what the GM's thinking. You know what the organization's thinking. They're thinking, we're right there. We're right there. And they've got all these players that they're pouring massive money into, right? Carlson, Pirtle, yeah. Timo Meyer, like, you know, all these guys. And, and, and then they just weren't, right? They just weren't right there. They haven't been right there since then. And, and, uh, yeah, it's wow. Does it shows? And, uh, I suppose, uh, I mean, like every team has to go through a rebuild cycle. And if you think of uh, a cup window as the, as the peak and a rebuild as the trough, uh, San Jose is just in a super deep trough. And it's, it's a good case study on maybe what not to do in the cycle of rebuilding and having a window and tearing down uh for golden knights fans though the reason we're talking about it so much obviously since it's san jose we we take a little bit of pleasure in watching san mm. jose do so yeah. poorly <laughs> although that rivalry is totally dead now and i gotta say i think the rivalry that's probably going to be big this year is the kings because the kings are, are actually looking pretty pretty sharp and the game against them was was not an easy one so i think that rivalry yeah. is probably going to fire back up again here i don't think it's been this intense since uh year one and i think we may see that again this year but um anyway yep, moving on to uh we talked about this we're going to cover just talk briefly about patrick kane so it's interesting what's going on with kane right talk to me about what's going on with patrick kane because we still don't know what's going to go on with yeah. that guy so this is this so this is a, is a strange one it's the thing in the off season that surprised me the most now he had to have uh, hip surgery, so hip resurfacing surgery is what it was classed as, which he had at the beginning of June, which is not obviously an ideal uh, time to be having it. Um, obviously, he was at the New York Rangers, so he couldn't have it before the season ended. They obviously made the playoffs, blah, blah, blah. But his timetable for being out was four to six months. Um, he's now back. His agent released a video a little while ago of him skating around, Um you know, doing different turns and stuff to try to show scouts, I suppose, that like he's still got it. He's still there. He can still move because any, any, and I've said this numerous times, any hip surgery to me is always a really pivotal moment for a player's career because if, if it doesn't work or if they don't get the movement back to what they had before, we saw it with Ryan Kessler, obviously at the Ducks and others, yeah, it just you, you can't skate the same, and unfortunately, as horrible as it is, the player just is never the player they once were. So I think that video was to try and kind of quash any fears that scouts might have. The problem then is that because it's so late in the season, everybody's already kind of salary capped up, or they're purposefully not salary capped up. In the case of someone like Chicago, um, which means that actually, say so, last year he was on. 10.5 million, I think, whatever the end last year was in his uh, in his um, Chicago contract. I believe it was 10.5 in terms of cap mm -hmm. hit and obviously what he was being paid. Right. Now, in terms of cap space right now, no team could afford that except for Chicago, which he's not going to go back to. So you're looking at teams that have cap space that could take him on, on either a smaller deal or take him on and kind of, do some chiggery pokery around that. And realistically, even if he took half the money he had before, you're still only looking at Detroit, Arizona, Nashville, Anaheim, and Buffalo. And none of those teams have been mentioned. The teams that have been mentioned are Dallas, Rangers, again, Florida, and the Oilers, all of which have no cap space whatsoever to be able to make a move like that, which means that to do it, there's going to have to be a, a far cleverer way of how they get around it. Mm -hmm. I'm just a little surprised that we're in November now and he's still a free agent. It just, it shocks me. Yeah. I think there's a, there's a chance that he becomes a deadline pickup. Um, and I could see the way that this could happen. Cause one of the questions that we asked ourselves, JP was, w could Vegas be in for him? I think mm -hmm. they, they could. There's a lot of movements they would have to make because currently the projected cap space for, um, the Vegas Golden Knights is zero. Um, the <laughs> deadline cap space is even at best, it's hoping to be 1.9 million, <laughs> right. uh, which means that that's not going to be enough. Yeah. Now, yeah. there not are players close, like yeah. Brett Howden, um, who, William Carrier, Colossar, who are all earning, you know, a couple of million, mm -hmm. nothing major. 
a McNabb, Haig kind of similar vein. So what could happen is that someone like a Chicago could sign Patrick Kane to 5 million or something like that and then trade him to the Vegas Golden Knights or another destination, whether it be Dallas or Oilers or Florida, something like that, retaining 50% of his salary. And obviously there'll only be a short amount of time left. Yeah. So that the, the team that actually takes Patrick Kane on properly is only really paying, say, two and a half million right, right. for the lap back half of the year rather than yeah. paying five million. That's a way that I could see it. Now, somebody may tell me that you're not allowed to sign someone to trade them within that time period. I don't believe there is that clause. I could be wrong. Um, but I do find it a bit surprising that we're sat here now and Patrick Kane, who is arguably the best American hockey player of all mm-hmm. time. Um, some people can hate that statement, but statistically, he's right up he's, there. He scored yeah. a lot of goals, right? Yeah. <laughs> and he's won a lot of cups, so he's pretty mm-hmm. good. And yeah. uh, and last year, he was still pretty good. He wasn't possibly the player that he once was, but you know, he's getting on in age, and as somebody who's in a similar age bracket to him, I can understand that. So yeah. I'm kind of surprised that it's that it's not there. But let's be honest, if anybody was going to do something off the wall to get that guy in, that's a Vegas move, right? That, oh, that yeah. to me feels like a Vegas move. Yeah, yeah. When it comes to cap gymnastics, uh, <laughs> I mean, honestly, Vegas is is right up there among the best. You know, the Lightning are also very good with cap gymnastics. Yeah, if, if there's a way, if they want it and there's a way, they will figure it out. It's interesting. Do you That's think? It. Do you think that we're still dealing with? A little bit of the fallout from the pandemic, uh, the hmm. cap, right? Obviously, the cap did not go up now for what at least a couple of years now. It's been it's been uh, solid. It hasn't moved, right? Uh, is is that some of what's going on? Because it's interesting. I know, like for instance, like Phil Kessel. I know he's not in the same league as Patrick Kane necessarily as a player, but Phil Kessel also still an unrestricted free agent. Still capable Nuts. of playing in the NHL, still an NHL Correct. level player. Right now, the guy doesn't have a job, and I feel like I could be wrong. I feel like this isn't something I I have heard about a lot in 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 recent years. It's something. It's kind of unique to this year a little bit, where these players who are capable NHL players who still have some gas left in the tank are just jobless. Is, do you think there's something to that? Just Are we looking at a little bit of pandemic fallout or am I way out in left field and this happens every year? No, I think you're, I think you're right. And when you actually go down the, um, the UFA list of, as per Cap Friendly on the 3rd of November, you've got Jonathan Taves on there. Everybody knows he's taking a year out. You've got Patrick Kane. You've got Josh Bailey, Oscar Clefbaum. A lot of these players, by the way, because Jake Gardner's also on there, Like we all know the reason Clefbaum and Gardner aren't playing. They're never going to play again. We all kind of know that. It's fine. Um, but Jesse Paul Jarvie's on there. You've got Nick Ritchie there. Um, Phil Kessel's there. Kiefer Bellows is there. Nolan Patrick's there. Um, you've got Wayne Simmons, uh, Brian Elliott, Aaron Dell. I like this, obviously, a few goalies. And then Eric Stahl, Ryan Murray, Zach Prise. A whole host of things that are, we, these are guys that are obviously going to be UFAs either in the next year or are currently. But there's, I think you're right in terms of that it's the, um, it is that COVID fallout. Yeah. But the cap is the problem. Now, the cap is going to jump by quite a considerable margin. I believe it's the end of this year. Mm. So that you might see teams doing deals where they're kind of moving cap space this year on the, because they know they can, they want to use it next year. But, mm. You know, I just, I, th- I think teams are more wa- wary than they used to be about taking it. And you never know what, excuse me, what, um, what Patrick Kane is asking for. Like he might not be asking for a one year deal. Yeah. Like he yeah. might be playing hardball and saying, I'm 34. Right. I want three years. Or I want two years. I don't want a one year deal. And, and that right. will, teams will look at that right now and go, mm, yeah, no. Because yeah. the other biggest change is, and this is in the last 10, 15 years, but young players earn big money now. Mm-hmm. And that's the, the bridge deal is almost dead. Yeah. You see eight-year deals flying around like, you know, like sweets. And mm-hmm. it's it just it hurts because it means that when you're an older player, it, you hit 30, and it's almost yeah. like the team is already looking at going, well, he's done. And right. then who's the 22-year-old we've got coming through? So yeah. I think there is is part of that. 
Um, but yes. you're right. Yeah. Kessel and Kane are probably the biggest names on that UFA list. Mm-hmm. Um, but it'd be interesting to see where he goes. I still think he could produce. And if I was going for the playoffs as Vegas and you could add a talent like that and you can make it work by giving a first round pick to Chicago or something to, mm-hmm. to kind of say, look, take 50% of the cap boys and we'll give you this back. Yeah. Why would you not do that? Yeah, absolutely. And that is, com- that is completely the kind of aggressive move that Vegas would make. That's what Mm. they're, that's what they're kind of known for. And, and uh, speaking of Vegas to bring it back into the Vegas camp, uh, Ian, we would like to introduce to our listeners a new segment. That's going to be a regular uh, part of our episodes going forward. And we're going to call it life on the farm. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> and, that, and that is a section dedicated to the Henderson Silver Knights, Life of the it Farm, is. who, who, by the way, um, wow, they are also off to a fantastic start. They were first in the league a couple days ago. They're second in the league right now, and that's only because they've got a game in hand on the Hershey Bears, who are first. Uh, but yes. wow, are they off to a, hard, to a hot start. They are 6-2-0, and mm-hmm. uh, first in the division. Second in the league, um, I mean, I, I think it's it's obvious to me that the addition of Ryan Craig as the head coach, who was an assistant coach for the Vegas Golden Knights from day one, I think that has had a massive impact on this team. And it's funny because obviously the Vegas Golden Knights have suffered massive criticism from around the league and from the fans, and and one of the the big things you hear is what about building for the future? And they're sacrificing the future. They're sacrificing their prospects for success now. And is that true? Is that really true? I mean, what are your thoughts on that? Cause it kind of seems to me like the prospect system is in decent shape. I don't know how an AHL team could perform this well if they don't have a lot of depth and talent. And, and we talked about this earlier, the golden Knights, they're not even fully healthy right now. They've had quite a bit of injury and they're still winning. That tells me that there's a fair amount of depth in the system, but I'm curious to get your thoughts in on this, on this start from Henderson. Is it the coaching? Is it, is it the consistency throughout the entire franchise? I mean, what's going on in Henderson right now? Cause they didn't have a great year last year. That's for sure. They did, they did not know. No, and you're right. Look, the team is is not massively different from last year either. Mm-hmm. Um, so I think that like you said Ryan Craig has got a lot to to, uh, to answer for in terms of the, the 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 performance being so good. I think he's he's done a fantastic job so far. Again, obviously, it's a small sample size. It's only been what you said uh, six two and zero, isn't it? So they played eight games. But it the one that, to answer your first question: Have they sacrificed the future for the now? Yes. Did it pay off? Yes. So, Good point. you know, yeah. I think that we all knew what Vegas was doing. They were in win now mode. And, you know, conversely for what I said earlier about the when your window is closing, make sure you realize that early. It's likewise, when your window is open, you go for it. You don't, right. you don't mess about. You don't try and say, well, we'll try and make sure we retain some picks and some prospects and we're trying to keep the window as open as long as possible. Now, nah, just go, go for it because – you know, you don't know how many times you're going to make the playoffs. So when you're in them, you want to you want to make sure you put your best foot forward, and that's what Vegas has done. So has that cost them first round picks? Yes. Has that cost them prospects? Yes. But there is still some great players in, in that AHL team. I just think with the difference between Henderson and some of the other farm teams, uh, without using that uh, cow again, is that um, <laughs> is that the the other farm teams have like the elite talent. The kind of we're waiting for this guy to blow up, yeah. like and just become like the NHL superstar. So whether that's mm-hmm. you know like Cooley or obviously Bedard is different level, but there's plenty of other players that were there, and, and we some of them are in the league now, like that were drafted as first round picks that are now the elite level talent. Vegas don't have that, but what they do have is three real standout performers for me, um, and hopefully I'm not going to butcher hit their names here, but Sheldon Rempel. Uh, has got mm-hmm. nine points in eight games, including five goals. That's fantastic start to the season. Grigory Denisenko, who I believe was drafted by Florida, if I'm not mistaken, 
um, who obviously has come across to Henderson now, um, he's had nine points in eight games, including four goals, which again is a good start. And he's he's relatively young in comparison to some of the other players on that team. And then a guy we talked about a few times actually now is is, is Gage Quinney, who has also scored six points in eight games, albeit only one goal. Um, interestingly, though, the thing that Henderson's problem was last year is still there, and that is the goaltending. It's still not very good. Um, you've got um, Patera and Vickman are the two goalies. Mm-hmm. Patera has been playing majority of the games. His safe percentage is 890. Vickman has, has got a 910 safe percentage, which, as we were saying earlier, is not bad. It's pretty average. Um, but I do feel like, unlike Vegas, Henderson's statistics would tell you that they're possibly not as good as their as their current standing would say. Yeah. I don't think yeah. they're bad, by the way. I'm not suggesting that they're fluking it, but I think that they're scoring, outscoring their goalie problems currently. Mm. Um, and if that mm-hmm. continues, then great. Right. But it's a very different situation to Vegas, whereas Vegas analytically are the juggernaut that you see in front of you, albeit, yeah. you know, you still think that they're not played a full game yet. Fair enough. But with Henderson, I think they'll probably middle out over the season. And then, yeah. I would guess, as an AHL playoff team. Excuse me, I still think that, but just not quite on the same level. Yeah, perhaps not a a, a Calder Cup contender, but but a, but probably make it into the playoffs. Yeah, yeah, it's interesting. Yeah. The it's interesting how teams can do that. Then can can kind of outscore their mistakes. And and it's funny going back to what we were discussing earlier. A team that comes to mind was the San Jose Sharks, the year that they went to the conference final and lost to St. Louis. They had, yes. I don't know if you recall, they had the worst goaltending in the league. The worst, not just bad goaltending, the worst goaltending in the league. Yeah. And somehow yeah. they made it to the Western Conference Final, and it was because their offense was just so potent. I remember their offense was so scary that year. Well, and that's the year that, of course, the, the, they had the big controversial Game 7 against the Golden Knights and all that. But mm-hmm. but their offense... The five-minute well, major. Yeah, the yeah. five-minute major or not a major... Mm-hmm. Uh, their offense scared me that year. I remember just thinking, wow, like it does not matter how down and out they are. Give them three or four chances and, and they'll score. Them. Yeah. <laughs> they'll score. Like you can never count the Sharks out. And I watched them do that a number of times that year. So, so it's interesting. I wonder if there's a little bit of that going on with Henderson. And like you said, this early in the season, it's a small sample size. So it's a little bit early to judge. Um, you know, I, I remember there was the year that the Buffalo Sabres won the first 10 games. They went undefeated for like 10 games. <laughs> everybody's like, oh, the Sabres are doing wonderful things and amazing things with this young franchise. And and then they kind of tanked and missed the playoffs. They so, did. It was funny yeah. because the NHL <laughs> was so desperate for Buffalo to be good. You could imagine that somebody was already like carving their name in the cup. <laughs> right. you know, like 10 games in saying, well, they're going to do it. They're going to do it. And yeah. then like you said, they obviously tanked yeah. and, um, exactly. and carried on their... Yeah, the 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 longest franchise in sports currently. That's Ugh. that's like without a playoff run. I, I believe I could get yeah. this could be complete. Yeah, I crap, think you're right. It's they're on a they got to be on there because it's ten been ages, or eleven so. year drought, something like that. So yeah, but uh, that's not a good rebuild, by the way. No. when we were talking about rebuild windows, <laughs> that's not the window you're aiming, you're aiming exactly. for. So. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. This is. This is how you don't do a rebuild. So well, it'll be fascinating to see how the, the season plays out for Henderson, but uh, cer- certainly off to a good start. Like you said, early early in the season, it's hard to judge, but uh, but the, but Ryan Craig is clearly having a, a, a solid and positive impact uh, on the team. Um, you know, moving on, there's no easy way to transition into this. M- moving on to a more serious talk topic. Anybody who keeps an eye on hockey, of course knows. And and for anybody who doesn't that a player named Adam Johnson, who who played a few games in the NHL for the Penguins, uh, was tragically killed by, and there seems to be some controversy over this as well, but I'm just going to say a freak accident on the ice. I have not watched the, the incident myself because that kind of thing is, is a little bit, um, traumatic for me and and so i have not wanted to seek out the footage to see it myself but but what i know about the incident was as sometimes happens in hockey strange situation where uh, a player's skate made contact with his neck obviously he had some sort of severe laceration on his neck and and eventually passed away at the hospital and that's an awful awful thing to happen and and ian i believe this was in the um 
the English was it one of the English leagues, it's a, right? Yeah, so it's the elite league, which is our top league. Yeah, um, right. And, and look, like you said, look, this, there, this is not nice to have to talk about this, but I think it's the right thing to do. We need to address we talked it. Talked about yeah. whether we were going to discuss it or not. Um, and, and and before we get into anything, obviously condolences to to his family. Yeah, what they're having to go through. Awful. He's twenty nine years old. This isn't somebody you know like. It's no, in no age is, is like, would make this you know okay in any stretch mm-hmm. of the imagination. But it's it's worse when you've got somebody who is is of that age, twenty nine, still in my opinion, still young. His whole life ahead of him, whether that would have been in coaching or whatever, mm-hmm. you know, it's it's a real shame. Yeah. Um, unfortunately, <laughs> you know, the footage was was put online. I I didn't. As anybody who follows me on on X knows that I I didn't agree with that. I I have seen the footage. I mm-hmm. have not seen the whole of it, and I do not want to. Um, but I've seen the collision, which is obviously you know how it was caused. Um. I've seen the comments afterwards. So the player who who skate uh, was to hit Adam was a player called Matt Petgrave, mm-hmm. um, and the game was between the Nottingham Panthers and the Sheffield Steelers. Now, to add a bit of context, to this Nottingham Panthers and the Sheffield Steelers hate each other. They are the two biggest teams um, in terms of rivalry in the Elite League. They have all the money. Um, the league is nowhere near as fair as the NHL. It's why I don't really follow it because I've got no interest in it because um, it's poorly ran. Uh, and uh, and if you listen to this podcast, I'd quite happily tell you how it's poorly ran. If the if the people that run it want to give me a phone call, I'd more than happily take that. Um, but uh, well, we haven't got time in this podcast to go through that. But in terms of the the rivalry, is is, is really really fierce. Which means that the first things that were coming out was he intended to do it. The player and and I've seen the footage. And all I'm going to say is this. I don't know the player, so I don't know his intentions. So it's wrong of me to to suggest one way or the other. But the way that he falls is not natural, would be what I would say. I'm not saying, and I'm going to be clear here, I'm not saying he intended to hit him anywhere near his neck. But, And I can't ice skate. So this, so this is, I can fall over, that I'm fine with, but I can't ice skate. But I would say that after seeing the way that he was, his trajectory towards the player and the way that he fell, it was an unnatural fall. Now, that could have been a freak accident, could have been intended. Honestly, we don't know. And to speculate, I think, is massively unfair. Um, the people that should investigate it will investigate it. I have no doubt in that. And that's the right thing to be to be done because, you know, this... This isn't. A, this is a very serious outcome to something here. This does not happen in our sport. Yeah. I think this has happened three times, super rare in total. And yeah. I'm pretty certain that, that if if not one of the first, Adam is the first, unfortunately, to have obviously uh, died from these injuries. Um, and it's it's an awful, awful thing that's happened. But I think, and and I can understand people wanting to blame someone for this. But I think you've got to be really careful that you don't accuse somebody of, of what would be a really serious, we're talking manslaughter, it's a really serious allegation, um, without truly knowing whether that was was the intention. But I, I, for those people that have seen the footage, and I would say please don't, but it it is an, a, obviously a natural fall. Um, now what has followed, I think is the bit that I really wanted to focus this section on, um, because you know it's... I think with, there's been a, there's a lot of people that will talk about everything else that went around it, and that's fine. I think the, the so the elite league, obviously, which is the uh, Britain's top hockey league, um, has now made it mandatory that net guards are to be worn by all players right. going forward. Mm-hmm. And what I see this moment being, and when there's tragic events like this, I always feel like if some good comes out of it, that's something that certainly the family and, and others could, can look at and say that obviously what happened is awful, but look at what we, the lives we protected going forward by the changes that were made in, you know, in the sport. And for me, we saw this in, in F1 when they introduced the halo yeah. and everybody pushed back on that and said, no, this is open wheel racing. The, you know, the, 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 the drivers know the danger, you know, it is what it is. Is, is the normal pushback you get. We've always done it this way. We're never going to change. And the Halo has already proven its worth in the, what, two, three seasons that it's been it's, it's been running for. There's been instances where, you know, you've seen it and you've seen the two cars come together and gone, Jesus, imagine if the Halo wasn't there. Right. In fact, don't, because we all know what that means. Mm-hmm. And and for me, that's where the, the net guard is the NHL's Halo moment. Yeah. Where for me... 
I know Bettman's got to decide what he does. And we mm-hmm. saw the same thing with visors. So the visors are, are supposed to be, everybody wears them, but there's plenty of players, including Ryan O'Reilly, that still don't have a visor. Right. So they have just the helmet and with, with nothing right. at all. Because they're grandfathered um, in. Yeah. Because they're not mandatory. Yeah. But, yeah, because the, and the way they, they play, and there'll be players that have never worn a net guard that will no doubt feel it, find it weird or will find it cumbersome or it hinders mm-hmm. their play or, or whatever. I'm not the right person to comment on that because as I mentioned earlier, I can't skate. So mm-hmm. it's going to make no difference to my ability. But I think this is something where the NHL has to just take a stance and say, guys, we don't care. Yeah. Like We don't want this to ever happen again. If this stops it happening again, it's a small price to pay. Yeah. Um, I've, I've researched before we came on the show what the net guards look like, their thickness, the, where they sit on the player's neck. It, we're not talking like, you know, like where they're, where they're full cage when they're in junior and stuff. Mm-hmm. Like these aren't massive items with, with pieces of armor we'd be expecting the guys to wear. It's just, it's just a very small change. But right. if it means that no other family will have to go through what Adam's family is going through right now, mm-hmm. then I think it's a, a change that has to be made. So right. I, I applaud the Elite League for making the change. Mm-hmm. Um, and the WHL, which has followed and made it mandatory, the NHL, as I said, is 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 currently the the line is that they're contemplating how to go forward. And I know some players have already started wearing it. Tom Wilson wore one the other night. Really, to try I didn't it out. know that. Interesting. Um, Just three in of the Penguins or... players have worn yeah. it. Yeah, um, have worn them. Should I say to 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 try them out? Um, mm-hmm. And I think you know if we if we made it mandatory. I almost guarantee that in a year or two years' time, nobody's talking about this. Yeah. And I don't mean as in Adam. I mean as in nobody's talking about the fact that, oh, well, they feel a bit weird when I play or, you yeah. know, it's it's uh, my slap shot is being affected by the fact that when I turn my shoulders, it, I can feel it. All those sorts of things would get moved out. So, you know, and if people disagree, then this we, we know what we're like on this podcast. We're completely open for free speech. So if you disagree with what I'm saying, please feel free to post in the comments below or let me know. But... I just think that the chance of this happening is so minute, so minute, which is why it's, 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 if it's happened before, it's, it's on a very, very, very low number. But even if there's a tiny percent chance, if this small change gets, makes it the chance zero, then you do it. Yeah. You know, and, and I think that's, that's the way the league has to go, in my yeah, opinion. Yeah, because at the end of the day, it's, it's sports, it's a game right? Like this is not life yeah. and death. This is, this is sports. It's, it's entertainment. Uh, by the way, I just uh, read as well earlier today, the WHL is going to make neck, neck protection yeah, mandatory so yeah, as yeah, well. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah. I mean, look, it's, it's, if you're, if you're going to try to compare it to something, you know, just go watch the old footage of the NHL back in the twenties, the thirties, the forties, the fifties, the sixties, even, you know, mm-hmm. these guys were out there skating around with no helmets, no masks. Goalies used to not wear masks. I mean, can you imagine a time when NHL goalies wore no mask, no helmet? That's insanity, if you ask Complete me. Insanity, yeah. But that was the norm back then. And, and there was one goalie, uh, I forget his name, but who kind of put his foot down on that and – he had had so many injuries to his face and head that he just kind of refused to play. He told the coach, like, look, either I wear this mask or I'm not going out there. And he was kind of the one that started that whole thing. So, you know, you liken it to, to, to that. If you compare it to that, like it's, there's a reason that all the safety equipment has started to become the norm because it's a dangerous sport. It's a contact sport. There's a considerable amount of risk involved. And, and if there's a way that we can enjoy the sport, and and have it be safer for the players then it's it seems like a no-brainer to me and and i i I think you're right ian i think most of the pushback if any will be from the players who don't like oh it's uncomfortable it's hot or what you know the the other reasons but uh i mean my goodness what a what a terrible terrible tragedy and and you're right you know incidentally speaking i think there was a high school player i'm reading here um teddy Teddy Balkan, right. yeah, high school sophomore who died last year, I think, from some sort of neck cut. And then, of course, there's the famous NHL incident that we all know about that happened in 1989, 
which was uh, I thought Clint, there were a couple. Yeah, yeah, Clint Malarchuk. Uh, that, 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 I think that's the most that's, famous one. But that's that's already three too many, right? And um, yeah, uh, absolutely. And that's why and we can't we're talking go back about and check a the cut past. to the artery. Yeah, I mean that's serious. Yeah, yeah. And, and and I know there was comments, and I also want to applaud the um, the staff on the day. For, for having to go out, you know, the, the medical staff, um, yeah. there were certain comments made around the speed of how how quick they got to him. I, I, can, I don't agree with any of that whatsoever. I think that they, they handled the situation well. They also mm. ushered out the fans so that they, they got rid of the fans out there. Right, the they evacuated um, the game, yeah. In fact, yeah, yeah. No, it was and then they cancelled the games, obviously, the, uh, the, the following games, um, you know, and postponed what, what, and so they did what they needed to do from the first. So I think from that perspective, I said hats off to those that, but, yeah, when, when it's something as bad as that, no matter how quick they would have gone onto the ice, unfortunately, it was it was futile anyway. Um, yeah. Which is obviously very sad, but it's just that's just the way the way it is. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and that's why, for me, I know the NHL doesn't like to force restrictions, but they were quite happy not that long ago to tell players they weren't allowed to have pride tape on. Um, mm-hmm. So if we can make that choice quick enough, I don't understand why it's going to take too long to say to players, you know what, guys, you're wearing them, and if you right. don't like it. That's fine. You forfeit right. your contract and you don't play. Yeah, it's got. It has to 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 not do it would be insane. Yeah, insane. yeah. This is we're not in ancient Rome here, right? This is not gladiatorial no. combat. This is this is sports in the modern world. It's it's an entertainment property. People forget that sometimes. I understand sports, yeah. professional sports. It's tribalism. Right, it inspires people. It brings people together. But at the end of the day, it's a form of entertainment. It's entertainment, yeah. right? And and so, you know, and the game's changed. Re- yeah, it's, there's it's no a lot excuse quicker now. For, there's more speed. Yeah. Like it's it's not right. Yeah, yeah it, it, it things, has to happen. It has to things happen. happen so quickly. The game's really physical. So, um, yeah, it's kind of a no brainer. And how quickly some of the smaller leagues have adopted neck protection. Just within days of this incident, I think speaks volumes as to how everybody it feels about It puts pressure this. on the NHL as well that they do that. So the more leagues yeah. that can do it, the better. Uh, I'd yeah. like to see some of the European leagues follow. Yeah. Um, so it isn't just the British league that have done it from on, yeah. on the, obviously, you know, ignoring the West Coast. But yeah, for, for UK and Europe, I'd like to see the SHL and other leagues step up. If they, they may have done already, by the way, I haven't seen the, the news, but I don't mm-hmm. think they have. Uh, yeah. So it would be good to see that happen as well. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, an absolute tragedy, the the passing of Adam Johnson. And, and like you said, hopefully, if if anything, hopefully some good can come from it. And, and that ultimately will be, a, you know, a safer, a safer sport, a safer environment for everybody. And, and yeah, you, you hate mm-hmm. to see anybody die doing something like, like playing hockey or playing any sort of sport. It's, um, it's totally tragic. Um, like I said, not an easy way to transition out of a topic like this either, but in the interest of time, no. since, since we're running a little short here, um, you know, let's move on to our last topic here. And, and that is, and Ian, you can speak to this a lot better than I can, obviously living in England. <laughs> um, so you feel like the NHL needs to make it easier to follow teams abroad or generally to, and I've heard you complain about this over the two years that you and I have known each other. Um, it's not easy overseas if you're an NHL hockey fan to follow the sport or to watch games, right? And and so talk to me a little bit about about the yeah. problems with that and um, what some of the challenges are. And you're you're right. Like uh, I, I, I the people know me long enough. I, I do have a soapbox constantly to my left, which I will have to get out at times. <laughs> you're gonna pull that in now. <laughs> I, I don't, yeah, I don't mind. So it's okay. It's um so so the like the NHL is it. Batman's big thing, whether you like him or not, was about his growth of the sport. And I do mm. think, to a point, he's done a good job of growing the sport. The expansion drafts have been a, a, a resounding success on, on, a, on, a, on, a, on a, a growth area that in previous iterations of the, the expansion drafts have been an absolute joke. And in, in most teams had absolute car crashes of, of opening seasons. Certainly we're never getting to a Stanley Cup final, that's for certain. So... Bettman has done some good things, but I think the one thing that the NHL still is lagging behind its counterparts, and I'm talking the NBA and the NFL here, is they've not turned on <clears throat> that European fan base. Now, look, I'm selfish, so I'm thinking the UK here, but you've got Germany, you've got Sweden, you've got Switzerland, you've got <clears throat> Finland, you've got all these countries that are you know, big into their hockey. 
and they no doubt do follow the NHL, but the league tries to make it so bloody hard to follow the NHL. Mm-hmm. It's just mind-boggling. Um, and it was only two years ago that the NHL app had an NHL TV thing that if you paid a subscription, you could watch all of the games either live or watch the full game kind of retrospectively. And then they got rid of that because they sold the rights to to separate companies. And now different companies have different games and it's just a mess. Yeah. So I thought it would be good to kind of whinge about it mainly as some sort of therapeutic thing for myself, <laughs> but also <laughs> because I thought it'd be interesting for the listeners and the, the viewers uh, who are in the US to understand why this is such a pain in the ass and why it's so hard for me to be able to just watch a game Okay, and it's not because like I'm stingy and I'm only watching it on YouTube. It's because even if I wanted to buy a subscription, there you isn't can't. one available for me yeah, to there buy. There isn't one available. I already yeah. pay mm-hmm. twelve. I think it's about fifteen pound a month, right, for Via Play, which is used to be called Premier Sports. Now it's called well, I think it's Via Play, but whatever. Yeah, those guys they have like two games on a night. Yeah, they're, 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 they're completely random, mm-hmm. and and they're not. They're like. They pick on the same teams all of the time. So you don't get that very bit. But I can't watch my team. And that's the bit. You're there going, look, guys, you're making this hard for me to follow. Mm-hmm. And, and that's just going to turn. If you were like a, like I'm, I class myself as, as relatively die hard. And I still find it hard to do it. Imagine if you were lukewarm to the sport. Why on earth are you going to yeah. spend 15 pounds why would you bother? For a subscription that has basically nothing other than the NHL and NASCAR, which I've got no interest in whatsoever. Right. Um, and yeah. to, to that, you're not going to do it. You've got a highlights package, right, which is um, NHL Tonight. Mm-hmm. Oh, my God. I mean, not only is it horrendously, like, uh, American anyway, in the fact that it's, like, very cheesy, <laughs> yeah. and they've, like, got the token guys, <laughs> yeah. and they're, like, oh, yeah. oh, oh, and all right. this, like, laughy crap between them. Yeah. They don't ever slag anybody off. So yeah. nobody ever says, God, they played really bad. Everything's, everything is, like I've said to you many times, everything yeah. is Lego. Yeah. Everything is awesome, yeah. like, tw- all the time. <laughs> the NHL is awesome. Right. Batman is awesome. Yeah. Every team, even San Jose, is awesome. Yeah. Um, it's just horrendous but they do this annoying thing so we've got a highlights program in the uk for football called match of the day okay which is not perfect but there's it's almost a joke now but it used to be on the news back when the news used to be once a day and wasn't in our face 24 7 it used to be if you don't want to know the scores of the game look away now and then you know jokingly you and your partner or whatever would not watch the result and then you watch match of the day because even though it was a highlights package you didn't know the bloody result because yeah. the problem is once you know the result you've got no interest in watching the why game watch yeah okay so why watch it mm-hmm. but they do nhl tonight and it has a ticker at the bottom which tells you the scores oh, I know. and you're there going, so annoying. guys come on <laughs> like not only do i have to put up with your they give away horrendous the scores. commentary yeah and this kind of camaraderie between these <laughs> wooden characters. Yeah. But like I then you then ruin the whole thing by having this score at the bottom. It's just yeah. complete insanity. Oh yeah. The real yeah. time stuff doesn't work because there's this nobody is staying up to two AM on a weeknight to watch a regular season game. Mm-hmm. And if they are, they either work nights or they really need to reassess their life choices. Because <laughs> I I don't do that. Why? And I and I get up at like as you know, JP, because we talk. But I get up at a ridiculous time in the morning, and I still don't have the time to mess around watching two hour footage of a regular season game of my team. It's just not going to happen. Yeah, yeah. I don't understand why you can't buy team packages. So like, why can't I buy a package for the year? Maybe like a couple of hundred pounds, Mm -hmm. but I get to watch all of Black Court games. Yeah, highlights some of them fine because uh, mm-hmm. there'll be blackouts and things and I get that you guys know all that all too well the pain of some people owning some stuff and some people owning other bits I get yeah. that but you know you have highlights stuff like already on your channel so you get to watch that kind of thing like we have so mm-hmm. if you compare the NBA and the NFL the NBA and the NFL yes they choose different games but both have highlights packages mm-hmm. both have are on Sky Sports which is kind of our main sports thing in the UK um, both have highlights and then kind of um, 
like the shows where they they talk about what happened. They have preview shows and post game shows and all that kind of stuff. We have NFL Red Zone, mm-hmm. which if you're a fan, you can watch the Red Zone and that allows you to see all the games going on at the same time. And you can watch your team's most important moments without having to watch the whole game. And yeah. then when your team's on telly, you can switch and watch the whole game. So I don't understand why the NBA and the NFL can nail it. Yeah. But the NHL seems to be stuck in this weird model yeah. where they think that people are going to pay. Because if I bought the two packages and have to buy BT Sport and Via Play, it would cost me about £50 a month, which in terms of dollars is about $65, $70 a month yeah. to watch maybe one Blackhawk game. Right. Every two weeks, it's highway robbery. Like, yeah, what would I? Why would I do that? You just <laughs> won't do it. And I, we are yeah. killing uh, the sport. Yeah, uh, on a European level, by mm-hmm. not having accessibility with these things yeah. today. Let's make sure I don't show the back of it to give some advertising to, <laughs> to right to, to the phone. To you maker. know who? Uh, yeah, exactly. It's <laughs> it maybe some sort of you know fruit, um, but the um, but like we we have the internet. Yeah, like me and you are able to record a podcast when I'm sat in the UK and you're sat in in the US in Vegas. We mm-hmm. have a time difference which is insane, right? Which is why if you didn't have that lovely background behind you, you're dark, I'm light, right? That's why. <laughs> it's why. But we make this work. Yeah. Okay. Yet the NHL can't seem to work mm-hmm. out that possibly people on a time zone that is seven hours different. Yeah. And not watching their games live. I, right. I really, and I, this is whinge over now, but I, I just think the NHL, if it really wants to grow and it wants to be a competitor the, to the NBA, the NFL, mm-hmm. this is like, this is the missing piece in the puzzle. They've got to get accessibility that much higher. Yeah. And, and to offer some hope, because I know there are some of our uh, hardcore Golden Knights fans that are listening to this right now are probably squirming to throw this in. So I'll throw it in. Uh, the, <laughs> yeah. It's like if you compare it to the record industry, you know, for a long time, mm-hmm. the, the record industry, they held on to, they kind of held ownership of the music and they had a system that wasn't working. And eventually, you know, Apple music came along or it was iTunes at the time. And eventually a new system Mm -hmm. came in because of how bad that was. And I do think that maybe not the NHL, maybe not the big networks, maybe they're not there yet, but I think a lot of the team owners are starting to get to that point where they're annoyed with that. They're frustrated with the fact that that's kind of holding back their ability to grow their own franchise and to grow their own followers. And most, uh, Vegas fans anyway know this already, but this year, Bill Foley launched. So there's a new TV deal for the Vegas Golden Knights. They are no longer with AT&T Sportsnet, who was, they carried, they were the regional broadcaster for the Vegas Golden Knights uh, since the franchise's inception. Well, this year they have a new deal with Scripps Sports. Now that's Mm -hmm. the broadcast part. I'm not as worried about the broadcast part, but what's interesting to me is that the Golden Knights launched their own streaming service this year, called Nighttime Plus. And I know it sounds like I'm giving them a plug. I'm not. We were not sponsored by them. But it's fascinating to me because that is exactly what you were just talking about, Ian. And if you subscribe mm-hmm. to Nighttime Plus, it's $69.99 US dollars, so, so $69.99 per year, to stream every Golden Knights game that's not a national game which is most of them, right? Uh, Every year, you know, I think the Golden Knights and most teams end up playing six to eight games that are nationally broadcast on ESPN. And so ESPN has the rights for those games, and so you won't be able to get those regionally. But otherwise, um, regionally speaking, if you subscribe to Nighttime Plus, you can watch. That's exactly what you were just talking about. Now, not all teams Mm -hmm. are doing that yet. But I do think Bill Foley is a bit of a visionary, and I think he has clued in to exactly what you are talking about here, which is, okay, this old system, kind of the old work. club, they're holding on too tight to all this, and it's inhibiting the growth of the sport. And Bill Foley is, as a very successful businessman, a visionary, I think he gets that. Like I said, I'm not, I'm not, uh, not trying to plug Nighttime Plus. Like I said, we're not sponsored by them, but I, I think you're <laughs> right. Yet. I th- yeah, not yet. Exactly. Hey, give me a call, Bill. Um, but uh, it's interesting, and I don't. I'm not. I don't subscribe to Nighttime Plus. I don't need it. I have cable, and so I, I I'm able to watch it through my cable package. But I think also by moving to Scripps Sports, 
Vegas Golden Knights games are now available through the HD antenna signal in the US. You can still you can capture certain networks wirelessly. I could be wrong on that, but anyway, they announced tonight on the broadcast. It's really relevant that Vegas Golden Knights viewership on the regional broadcast has gone up like 135% this year as compared to prior year. That's insanity. That's that's an insane wow. jump. So that tells you that what you're saying, Ian, has some real validity, right? People yeah. are watching now because they can. And that's money left on the table. That's viewership left on the table. That's fans left on the table. So it's yeah, interesting. It's an interesting development. It's, it, you know, and I, I know people find it hilarious that I get so animated about it, but the, the two bits, those that know me know that you know, I work in sales anyway and – you know, and for, and obviously I'm based in the UK, which means there's two parts of my brain that are screaming and are saying it's a missed opportunity in terms mm-hmm. of growing viewer numbers and the industry as a whole. So that because you know, for the topic we were talking about earlier, which obviously is an extremely sad topic, but that has been nationwide press, okay, mm-hmm. all over the sport. Uh, but it's sad that that's the first time in a lot of things that the NHL will even have been on the radar. Or the sport yeah. will have even been on the radar. And mm-hmm. I think like a lot of people in the UK, there's a lot of people in Europe that if they saw the sport, they would get into it. And that's how you grow. That's how you grow what effectively is a business, mm-hmm. is that you grow it by increasing the number of customers. Right. You can't do that. If you make yeah. it hard for your customers to buy your product, it's why, yeah. a- why and if we're plugging a lot of companies today, why Amazon created the one-click purchase. Because mm-hmm. they knew that the easier you make it for somebody to buy something, yeah. the more likely they are to do it because you're taking mm-hmm. away the barriers. So yeah. you're making that much easier. Whereas the NHL seems to be intent on putting barrier after barrier after barrier after barrier because yeah. they're just almost like auctioning themselves to the highest bidder. Right. And it's, they're just not thinking about that kind of fan experience. And I, and I really, they really need to get a handle of it, man. And, yeah. and that, that Nighttime Plus, that sounds, and again, that sounds like we are plugging it, but I'm, well, obviously I have no idea what the hell it is. But I'm just saying yeah. from what you just said then, yeah, that sounds like the sort of thing that if I was in, you know, Switzerland and I wanted to follow the Golden Knights, it's maybe perfect. that's my team. Yeah, right. I've got no way of getting to the games, but mm-hmm. I might go once in a blue moon. But it doesn't mean you don't buy merch. It doesn't mean yeah. you don't buy all the other things that a business takes in as revenue. Uh-huh. That makes perfect sense to me. Yeah. Oh yeah, it's perfect. I remember just a quick story, and I know we we got to wrap up shortly here, but uh, I remember going years ago. I went. This was maybe season two or season three for the Golden Knights. I went and and uh, when they do their East Coast road trip where they play, you know, the Rangers and Jersey and um, and the Islanders, they usually do that in one trip because it's all really close by there. And I went out there one year to watch those games. And at Madison Square Garden, after the mm-hmm. game, I randomly met this woman who was English, who had fl- a huge Golden Knights fan. And she had flown over because it's a shorter trip, right? Obviously, to the East Coast of the United States. It is. Yeah, um, yeah and she th- flown over, hours, and yeah. she was going to see the Rangers. That she was going to watch them play the Rangers, the Devils, and the Islanders. You know, she was in town mm-hmm. for four or five days. There's a lot of people out there like that, uh, and it, it that that was the first time that it had been made aware. Like that's the first time I was aware of that. I was like, wow, this seems so random. But there's a lot of people who love the sport and and uh, and making access to the sport easier for them is comes it's the typical pattern right the old guard who's holding on to the money <laughs> right it, it's it's this is a pattern we see play out all the time but it, it's fascinating to see that bill foley has i think he gets that and he is you know obviously he's a businessman he's very wealthy he but he also gets it at the same time he gets it like oh yeah. wait a second we're leaving money on the table here but um well, we, we've certainly solved all the world's problems, Ian, as we do um, every time on the Golden Steel podcast. And we'll be back in <laughs> yeah. a couple of weeks to do it again. Unless there's significant Golden Knights news, uh, we will record, as we've mentioned last week, we'll sometimes record a special episode if there's something significant that happens. But uh, barring that, we'll see you all in a couple of weeks here. Uh, it's been great. We're happy to be back into the season uh, after a shorter off season this year. It felt long, but uh, Ian, thanks buddy. And uh, to our listeners, thank you very much guys for hanging out with us and uh, we'll see you next time. Stay safe, stay well. Uh, and hopefully the golden Knights trend of uh, success and victory continues. We'll see you next time guys. Take it easy. Bye-bye.